All right, everybody, this is Danny Brown. Welcome to Globalization and Culture One. This is day four. I'm playing a little bit of country music today because uh, we are in the middle of our rodeo unit. I've been teaching you about uh, rodeo, which is very uh, popular in the Southwest United States. Now, I used to live in Texas. Many of you know that. When I was in Texas, I, uh, I had a pair of uh, cowboy boots. I wasn't really a cowboy, but uh, I love these boots. They're beautiful, and they went with my uh, suits well. And I used to wear these at AWA, but uh, sometimes when you were in Japan and you take them on and off and on and off, it's very difficult. So I kind of stopped wearing them, but I miss my boots. They're beautiful. Um, and uh, many people who uh, do um, rodeo, they, they wear cowboy boots. They just love cowboy boots. They're not very comfortable. Cowboy boots are beautiful, but not comfortable. Okay. Uh, now we're going to continue our unit here and uh, let's get up on this okay so here we are we were working on rodeo last week and uh, we talked about five events bull riding which we have not given detail about for bull riding not yet bronc riding I talked a little about bronc riding. I did not do a good job, and the video was bad. I'm sorry. So we're going to do bronc riding again. And we talked about calf roping. Uh, and on our test last week, many of you did a good job. You understood the calf roping, so I felt good about that. And then steer wrestling, barrel racing. Here's bull riding. Oh, just one minute, please. Okay, there we are. And so now here's our bull riding. Uh, beautiful bull, very dangerous animal. Here's bronc riding. I'm going to talk more about bronc riding, riding soon. Beautiful animals, horses are, but very big and very heavy. Uh, going to talk about calf. We've talked about calf roping already, and you did a good job of that. Uh, we'll talk about steer wrestling. Very dangerous uh, sport steer wrestling and barrel racing barrel racing uh, now some people might think oh barrel racing is easy it is very difficult barrel racing is very challenging okay so last week we talked about bronc riding and calf roping but i i think i did not do a good job of explaining bronc riding and the video was bad so i want to teach that again okay bronc riding has two styles the saddleback bronc riding and the bareback bronc riding now, in saddleback wrong riding, the rider sits on a saddle. A saddle is a leather seat for a horse. Okay, whoops. Uh, again, I need my picture. Okay, here's my seat. Saddle. A uh, saddle is a leather seat for a horse. Um, and so in saddle bronc riding, the rider wears a saddle. You can see right here, you can barely see that saddle that he's wearing. Now in uh, bareback bronc riding, right here, bareback bronc riding, the rider does not sit on a saddle. Bare means no cover or no clothes. And so he just sits directly on the horse with no saddle. It's difficult and painful to sit on a horse with no saddle. Uh, this woman is bareback riding, but, but people don't usually want to do that. It's very painful. And so uh, bareback bronc riding, is a very dangerous, very difficult um, sport. Uh, first, in, bear, in bronc riding, the horse is put into a fence area called a chute. A chute is a box, basically. And the rider sits on the horse in the chute. And the rider sits on the horse and he must hold a rope in one hand, his left hand or his right. He holds, and his other hand's held high in the air, so he's holding the rope like this, and he's holding his other hand in the air. Okay, and he has to keep that hand in the air. All right, and the rider must put his feet above the horse's shoulder. I'm having trouble with my. Okay, let's start uh, here. The rider um, sits on the horse. He must hold a rope in one hand. You see the blue rope that he's holding, and he can hold it in the right hand or the left, and his other hand is held into the air. And now, uh, 
the rider must put his feet high above the horse's shoulder. Here's his feet up high, making it difficult for the rider to balance. So the rider's like, whoa. Uh, here's another example. Uh, the rider has his feet here. Here's his foot. And here is the shoulder of the horse. And the rider kind of laying back here, lying back here before they start. And the chute door is open and the rider must stay on the horse for eight seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Doesn't sound difficult, but it is very difficult. It's like a dance. The rider gets more points for smooth riding and rhythm with the horse. Let's look at some pictures here. Okay, see how the horse is trying to shake the rider off, get off of me. And the rider is riding like a dance with the horse. Now here's a video of this happening. Okay, now he's laying back and his feet are up. Open the gate, start the clock, and there he goes. Okay, that's the eight second timer. Very fast. It is extremely difficult to stay on the horse for eight seconds. All right. Now, uh, let's watch a bronc ride in slow motion. Remember, the cowboy gets points for a smooth ride and rhythm with the horse. Uh, this man talking is, a, is the rider, and he's telling what he is thinking while he's riding. You may not understand, but it's okay. His left hand is up. Right hand holding the rope. The horse is kicking wildly, saying, get off of my back. The rider is not hurting the horse. The horse is okay. These are wild horses. Like a dance. Very good. Okay. Now he's going to jump off the horse. Very good. And he is finished. Okay, when a horse shakes and jumps, it is called bucking. If a horse really strong strong is strong and bucks well, the rider gets more points. Let's look at an amazing horse. This horse is considered the best bucking horse in the world. At least he's one of the best. The horse's name is Virgil. Virgil. Now let's review calf roping. Uh, calf roping, the uh, calf comes out of the chute. The rider is on the left and he tries to catch the calf with a rope. Um, there's a woman. Usually the uh, calf roping cowboys are not ladies because they're not strong enough, but sometimes the ladies can do it. They can. There he is, jumping off his horse to catch the calf. And they've got to uh, hold on to the calf and tie one, two, three legs together, and it has to stay. Now, we watched that last week, so we won't watch a video. Next is the steer wrestling. A man or a woman rides on a horse on one side of the gate, and a partner rides a horse to control the steer. Okay, can you see that? So uh, you have one horse on this side and one horse on this side, and you want to keep this steer between the two horses so that this rider can get close and jump on him. All right, the, the main cowboy jumps off his horse and grabs the horns of the steer. Then he wrestles the steer to the ground. The steer's side must touch the ground. And there's a 
I know the cowboy make, putting that steer on the side. Cowboy gets points for the fastest time. The fastest cowboy wins. Okay. Let's see if we can get you a video. All right. Here's your uh, video. Down. Notice the time is on the left. Oops. So we'll see the time. And down, 3.6 seconds. Oh, he's doing a little dance there. Grab him and down, 3.6 seconds. Okay, 3.6 seems like a good time. Oh, he's happy. These are big men, big men. Very, very big strong. 3.5, okay, he's got the fastest. This kid's got to be Okay, wrestle, down. He's happy. How many seconds? 3.5. Strong man, he's a strong man. Three point five. All right, we'll stop here. Okay, so here we are with our uh, PowerPoint again, and this is the steer wrestling. And remember, a steer is a like a bull, but they have. Uh, I told you last week they have cut the steer so he cannot have children. And that makes him less angry. Okay, now our last uh, rodeo event, there are five. The last one is uh, barrel racing. And barrel racing is uh, on a horse. We get on the horse and it is usually for, for excuse me, for women. Men can ride in barrel racing. Sometimes men do barrel racing, but the women struggle to do the steer wrestling, the bull riding, uh, the calf roping, because it's so difficult. It takes so much power for these big animals that a lot of women want to do rodeo, and so they do the barrel racing. But barrel racing is not easy. It's very, it's very dangerous and difficult. Um, you race, but only one rider at a time. One rider goes uh, out into the field and, whoops, excuse me. Okay, the uh, rider goes out into the field and uh, begins here, comes out very fast, goes around a barrel. Now they have to go really fast, but if they go too fast, their horse goes too far. And then that takes them a long time to come around. So they have to go around uh, very short, go short around the barrel, not long around. And because they have to go short around, it's easy for the horse to fall, excuse me, to fall. And then they go around the third barrel and then back. And when they cross this line, chick, they check the time. Here's a, a picture of a horse rider going around the barrel. It's very dangerous, very difficult. Okay, uh, let me show you a um, video of that. Okay, here we are. This is MBHA barrel racing. Here she comes out around the barrel. You gotta go as fast as she can, but cut close to the barrel and around. Close to the barrel, and there she goes as fast as she can. Beautiful horse. Love that Palomino horse. Palomino is a horse with a dark body and light hair, blonde hair, beautiful. Okay, here comes the second horse. Here we go. Beautiful horse. I just love horses. They're so beautiful. 
And here the rider goes around the horse, around the barrel, and around the barrel again. Oh, her time's not so fast. She's got pink on her saddle. Can you see the pink? Some ladies put pink on their saddle. And there she goes. Okay. Now I'm going to show you one more barrel racing. This is called barrel racing accidents. I told you barrel racing is very dangerous. And uh, they people often have accidents. And so let's watch this barrel racing accidents video. She's jumping. Whoa, she falls off. Oh, hits the fence. Oh, horse falls down. Horse falls down. Oh, horse falls down. When a horse falls down, if they fall on you, it's really dangerous because they are so big and heavy. And they're riding very fast. Very, very fast maybe 40, 50 kilometers an hour. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a man. He looks pretty big on that horse. And oh, he falls off. So this, uh, barrel racing can be quite dangerous. He's got that pink on. And then he falls. All right, we'll stop there. So that's our barrel racing. We're gonna do one more and that is bull racing. Now, if we're in the class, I usually get a big desk and I get a rope and I show you bull uh, riding, excuse me, not racing, bull riding. Uh, but I cannot do that today, I'm very sorry. So we'll just have to look with the pictures. The pictures are great, videos are great. Bull riding is the most dangerous and most exciting event in rodeo. Not everyone wants to ride a bull because they want to, the bulls want to kill you if they can. In fact, when you watch bull riding, you'll find yourself <gasps> very tense all the time. You're afraid for the bull rider, afraid he's going to be hurt. All right, he's a very big animal. Um, bull is about 860 kilometer, excuse me, kilograms average, very large. A bull is a male cow, a male cow. Uh, one rope is tied around the bull's chest. Okay, can you see that? There's a, a, a rope tied around the bull's chest. And another rope is tied around the bull's flank or side. And the bull makes a, a, a the, uh, excuse me, rope here makes the bull want to kick. He doesn't like the rope. So he kicks to try to get the rope off. But it does not hurt him. Now the bull is put into a box. Oops, there's another bull oh, throwing that man off. Oh, that bull, he fell off and that bull's gonna land on him. Very dangerous, okay. Um, okay, so for bull riding, um, if the cowboy rides eight seconds, he gets points, eight seconds. If he fails, oh, I'm sorry, I spelled fail wrong. If he fails to ride eight seconds, he gets no points. So he has to stay on eight seconds. Now the bull rider gets a possible hundred points. Uh, he gets 50 points for a skillful ride, the cowboy's ride. Smooth riding, okay, not jerky, but smooth. And riding in rhythm with the bull. The bull is, is moving back and forth. And the cowboy should move with the bull. If the bull's moving forward, the cowboy should not be jerking. And also in control and not about to fall off. If the cowboy's like, oh, then he's not in control. And so these things make for a skillful ride. And also uh, you get 50 points for a difficult bull. Um, if, oh, that says ots, that should say lots. There you go. If, um, if the bull is too easy, it's boring. And um, so we want the bull to have lots of shaking, shake and turning, 
and high kicking with his legs and any difficult moves that shake the cowboy and make it difficult. If a very difficult bull uh, is uh, running around, the cowboy can hardly stay on him. And so he, he should get points for the difficult bull. If a bull is easy and doesn't move or jump much, it's too easy for the cowboy. He should not get um, good points. Now, if a bull is too easy, the cowboy can complain and say, look, this bull was too easy. That's not my fault. And the judges will let him ride a different bull to, uh, to change so he can get more points. Uh, let's watch a, a video of a man explaining bull riding. I'm not sure if you can follow his English. He speaks pretty quick, but uh, you can get some ideas of bull riding rules. Hi, I'm Ty Murray, president of the PBR. I'm about to give you a crash course in bull riding 101. throughout the ride it is wrapped around the chest of the bull directly behind the animal's front legs. At the bottom of the rope hangs a metal belt designed to give the rope some weight so that it will fall off the bull as soon as the rider is bucked off or dismounts the animal. A bull rider who has been bucked off is thrown from the bull before the required eight seconds expire. The rider consequently does not earn a score. Sometimes a bull rider can be disqualified and therefore receive a no score even if he stays aboard his designated bull for eight seconds. A bull rider is disqualified if he touches the bull or himself with his free hand during the ride or if his riding hand comes free from the bull rope at any point during the eight second ride. Eight seconds is the amount of time the bull rider must stay aboard his bull to receive a score. During the eight second ride, the bull rider cannot touch his free hand to the bull or himself or he will be disqualified. A flank strap is a strap that goes around the flank of a bull. Its purpose is to enhance the natural bucking motion of a bull and to encourage the animal to extend his hind legs when trying to get his rider on the ground. A flank strap never covers or goes around the bull's genitals and no sharp or foreign objects are ever placed inside the flank strap to agitate the animal. Pulling the flank strap too tight will restrict the bull's motion, making it uncomfortable for the bull to perform. The flank strap is designed for quick release and is removed immediately after the bull exits the arena. The idea behind the flank strap is to put it on tight enough so it stays on, but loose enough that the bull thinks he can kick it off. That's what makes the bulls kick. If a rider is fouled, it means something happened during the 8 second ride that gave the bull an unfair advantage over the bull rider. This can include the bull hitting the rider or himself on the bucking chute at the start of the ride, or the flank strap falling off the bull before the ride is over. When a foul occurs, the judges often award the bull rider the option of a re-ride. The perfect score would be 100 points. That's never been done in the PBR. Each judge has 50 points to distribute for each ride. 25 points for the bull, 25 points for the rider. The total from each of these judges is added together to get the ride's total score. Judges are allowed to award a bull rider a re-ride, a second ride on a different bull. If they feel his first bull did not perform at the level of the other bulls in the competition and therefore did not give him a fair chance to earn a high score. Thanks for coming, and I hope this helps you enjoy the show. Okay, so you'll notice that uh, one thing that the um, man said and showed pictures of was that the rider has to keep one hand in the air and he has to hold the rope on the bull. Now in the bronc riding, the man has to hold a rope in the air, okay? But on the bull riding, he holds the rope close to the bull and keeps one hand in the air. If this hand touches the bull, he's out. He does not get any points. So he has to keep that hand in the air, one hand on the bull, and dance, so to speak, with the bull. If the bull pushes him against the fence uh, and, and it takes away his smooth ride, it's not the rider's fault. That's a foul and he can ask, please let me ride another 
bull. He's got to ride eight seconds and he wants a difficult bull. Now, um, we'll watch another video here. Okay, I'm gonna show you one more video. Uh, this is a video about a bull uh, who the rider is riding the bull and the rider falls part way off the bull, but his foot is still connected to the bull and the bull is pulling him and people are trying to save him. This is an example of how a person can be hurt on a bull. Oh, he falls. Oh, oh, it's his hand. His hand is still attached, and the bull is stepping on him. And the men are helping him. It's very dangerous. Will he be injured? All right, the man is safe. He's safe and everyone is happy. So bull riding injuries are quite common. Uh, these guys uh, take a big risk. They uh, can get stepped on, things broken. Uh, this man's in a coma. That means he cannot think, he cannot talk. Hope he's going to be okay. All right. Now, uh, rodeo is fun. It's also dangerous. But children love rodeo, and they see their parents doing rodeo. They watch rodeo, so they want to take part. And so we have junior rodeo. Junior rodeo is a rodeo for children. They usually let the children ride calves or sheep, not horses or bulls. But for a child, a calf or a sheep is an amazingly strong animal. Um, here's a picture of a child with a helmet, wearing a helmet, riding a calf. And for this child, this is a very big animal. Another child with his hands up, trying to stay on that calf. Um, they also ride sheep. Not only girls, but boys also ride sheep. Sheep are very difficult to stay on, extremely difficult. Oh my, help me. Uh, that's a ram, that's a male sheep with his horns. There's a girl being stepped on by the sheep. Ouch, 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 get off me. Okay, now a uh, chaff, calf chase, excuse me, I think I spelled that wrong. There you go, I changed that, a calf chase. Uh, is when, excuse me, is when a, uh, a child chases a calf. Now look on the, here are the calves, one, two, three calves, and on their tail is a red ribbon. Sometimes it's a yellow ribbon. They tie the ribbon on the calf's little tail. And the children run, and they try to catch the calf by grabbing the ribbon and if they grab the ribbon off the calf, they bring the ribbon to the judge and they win the prize. It's called a calf chase. Here's another one. The children are chasing the calves, trying to take the ribbon off his tail. Uh, now, sometimes they actually ride the animals. And we're going to see a, a junior rodeo. Let's watch a junior rodeo with children riding calves. Very fun, very interesting, but ooh, if you're the parent, I wonder how you feel that your child is riding on these calves. Let's watch. Oh, uh, by the way, these are boys and girls. Often the girls wear pink trousers, pink nosebone. Okay, so the question is, would you let your child ride in a junior rodeo? Would that be exciting and, and a good experience or would that be dang too dangerous for you to let your child do that? Okay, well, we're finished with our rodeo unit, and we're going to begin a unit with education. Education is fun. My expertise is in education. My wife is a teacher. I'm a teacher. My father is a teacher. My wife's father is a teacher. 
my son, my oldest son is a teacher. My second son is a teacher. So we are from a family of teachers and I have a PhD in education, uh, foreign language education. So we're gonna, I'm gonna enjoy teaching education. We're gonna study uh, some uh, interesting things that will be um, surprising to you. We're gonna go into the classroom. We're gonna go into an elementary school with video and watch the teacher teaching the students. And we're gonna teach you something called the IRE, uh, which is a communication style between the teachers and students. And it helps shape the American culture and why American people are very verbal and why we can speak our opinion so quickly, partially from the IRE in the classrooms. And we're gonna watch high, uh, junior highs and especially a high school and how that they have a discussion in the high school and the teacher can get the students to give their opinions openly. Um, I hope that you'll enjoy that. We're also going to discuss culture groups in high school, various culture groups, and how the, the high schoolers don't really like clubs, so they kind of join together in their own informal groups. So I hope that you'll enjoy this unit. Uh, first of all, let's start with um, studying some vocabulary. You will have a vocabulary test next week based on this, so please study this vocabulary. Uh, number one, differences. We're going to talk about differences between uh, cultural groups and education in America and education in Japan. Transportation. There's a difference between transportation between the two countries. Uniform, seifuku. Americans do, some schools do have uniforms, but most American schools do not. Outdoor shoes, indoor shoes. Uh, indoor shoes are like wabaki. They're shoes that students wear inside the school. Outdoor shoes are any shoes that you go outside and you wear. Clothes, fuku, uh, recess, uh, jikan. Okay, that's basically playtime for the children. It's called recess, playtime. Music instrument is a gaki. PE means physical education. P, physical, E, education, it's taiku gaku. Air conditioner is air kon. Air means air. Kon is short for conditioner. It means to change the, the air. Uh, heater is uh, hita or uh, damboki. Math or mathematics. Now the British say maths with an S on it but Americans say math, and that's sugaku. Ability is nodyoku. Marijuana is marifana or marijuana. That's a big problem in my country, marijuana. High tech is high tech. Social skills is shakai gino. Some people have good social skills. They're excellent with people, and they're very popular. Some people have bad social skills and they don't know how to make people happy. They don't know how to have conversation. Smart, now in Japanese, smart means yaseta, uh, thin, but that's not American English, uh, or I don't believe British English. Smart in American English is kashikoi, atamaga i, okay? Uh, country music, that's the music that we were listening to when we were watching the rodeo, kids rodeo, that's country music. Pick up, that's a kind of uh, car, but it's a truck, and they're very popular in Texas and in many places in America. And they're very big. Death, okay, death. Suicide is jisatsu. Poetry, ibunshi. Oh, excuse me, inbunshi, inbunshi. Uh, wrist would be urekubi, urekubi, wrist wrist. Entrance exam or entrance test is nyugaku shiken. Uh, you might be surprised to find that many people in America never take an entrance exam in their life. They're very, uh, there are entrance exams, but they're not so popular. Uh, yokyu is to require, yokyu. Bachelor's degree is uh, gakushi gakushigo, gakushigo. You guys now are working on a four-year degree. When you graduate, you will get a degree. It's called a bachelor's degree. 
okay? So you will get a bachelor's degree. Minority, that's shosu minzoku, shosu minzoku. That's when one race has a small number of people and one race has a big number. And the small number is called the minority and they don't have much power in society, minority. Educational tra tradition. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, that says tradition. This just says kyoiku. Kyoiku is education. Educational tradition is kyoiku no dento. Okay. Positive is poji, po, I can't speak Japanese well, positive. Negative is negative. Okay, so positive is like plus, negative is minus. All right. Positive is good things, negative is bad things. Okay, so this is uh, the vocabulary. I think it's not difficult, but I want you to make 100%. So uh, let's talk about the uh, organization of American schools. We have here years of education in the United States. Uh, we have grade, the grade is first grade, second grade, third grade, and the age. Now, first we have preschool, uh, age three and four, and this is not required by the government and uh, age three and four goes to preschool and then age kindergarten is age five and six now in japan yochien is called kindergarten and yochien or kindergarten in japan is three years and americans are shocked what three years uh in america kindergarten is one year age five and six and we don't want our younger children to go to school we don't want children even preschool many parents do not want preschool we want our children home until age five, and then they're ready to leave. They're, they're ready because mom and dad have taught them. You know, there are two systems of schools in American schools, two most usual, type one and type two. Type one school system in America has elementary school, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, okay? Uh, age six is first grade. You start school when you're age six. I started when I was five, but now we don't do that. It's age six. And you finish when you're age 11. Now, middle school. Middle school is kind of like junior high, but it's not. It's younger. Middle school is younger. Age sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade is middle school. Age 11 to 14. And then high school starts at ninth grade. Japanese high school is three years. Um, uh, but English American high school is four years. Okay. Now here we have first year of high school is called freshman. And you see this word here, freshman. Fresh means new, new person. Okay. The second year in high school is called 10th grade, sophomore. We do not say this O, do not pronounce the O. It's, it's, Soft more. Okay. 11th grade is junior. And 12th grade, that's Koko Sanense, is senior. So here we have freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. We use that in high school. We also use it in college. Freshman, junior, sophomore, senior. We use that in college. So you guys, if you're a second year student, you're a sophomore. If you're a third year student, you're a junior. If you're a C, if you're a fourth year student here at AWA, you are a senior. Okay, so remember that. That's going to be on your test. Please remember those words. So this is type one school. Now a type school, type two school also has 12 grades, but elementary school is through seventh grade. I went to this kind of a school. First through seventh grade is elementary school. And then junior high is actually eighth and ninth grade. Okay, junior high, eighth and ninth grade. Now, ninth grade is in the junior high building, but strangely, it's considered part of your high school. I don't know why they put ninth grade in the junior high school building, but it's actually part of high school. And then the high school was 10th, 11th, 12th grade. That's the kind of school I went to. Many children go to that kind of school. Uh, these are two common types of schools. There may be other systems, but type one and type two are very common. Now, educational requirements are different for each state. There are 50 states, remember, 50, and each state is different. Some states require that you attend an, uh, school until you're age 16. At age 16, you can quit school forever. 
Some states require that you attend school until you're 18. At age 18, you can quit. In Texas, you can quit school when you're age 18. Now, Japan, I forgot. I think it's age 15. I think in Japan, when you're age 16, you can quit school. Okay. Uh, anyway, in Japan, it's junior high. Uh, junior high is required, but high school is not required in Japan. But in most American uh, states, high school is required. Now, colleges. We have a junior college. That's a tanki daigaku. It's a two-year college. It's freshman and sophomore. Okay. And you can usually graduate and get a two-year degree. That's junior college. Now, college is a four-year uh, uh, daigaku. It's a small school. Ewa College would be called a college. Ewa, sometimes we translate Ewa University. Uh, that's, for British English, that's correct. But for American English, it would be Ewa, Yamanashi Ewa College. That would be American English. British English, Yamanashi Ewa University. Now, in America, a university is four-year also like the college but a university is a large school that is a collection of several colleges okay so you have the college of education the college of math uh, the college of science and then each of those has many departments and so a university is several colleges together okay if awa college and yamanashi gakuin Daigaku College, if those two join together, they could become a university, okay? But it's, a university is a collection of colleges. Now, in America, college is not required, of course. It's not required in Japan. About 71% of American children graduate from high school. Oh, that's bad. That's very low. Actually, uh, if you compare the ability of Americans to read with the ability to Japanese to read, it's the same about 99% of Americans learn how to read, okay? But, but high school is not required uh, in some states. And in other states, it's required, but they quit anyway. Now, about 50% of American children, which is 70% of high school graduates, will enter college, okay? So 71% of Americans graduate high school, 50% of Americans go to college, all right? Now, they don't graduate, but they start going to college. About 28% of American children graduate, excuse me, graduate college. Now, look at this. Look at the difference. 50% enter college, but only 28% graduate. Why? Well, uh, let's look down here. Uh, U.S. college is very difficult. It's easy to get into college, but it's difficult to graduate. And down here, of four, let me make that bigger. Just a little bit bigger here. Okay. Of American four-year colleges, 56.2% of students who entered the colleges in 2010 had a degree six years later. Okay. From 2010 to 2016, 56.2% of these people graduated. Uh, that means that the other 44% failed or they quit school. Overall, the federal figures report 62% of white students finish their college degree. 45.8% of Hispanics finish their college degree. Only 38% of blacks uh, finish their college degree. Why 38%? Well, uh, the black community is less affluent, means they have less money. And there's a lot of struggle for, um, to pay the college. Also, uh, there is more of a um, tradition in white families to go to college and less tradition in black families to go to college. And so many start college, but only 38% of blacks finish college. Uh, Asians, 63.2% of Asians in America graduate college. That's higher than the whites. Yes, Asians do better in education in America than whites do. So there's a, there's a rule that in American colleges, it's easy to get into college, 
but it's very difficult to get out. Now, do you know what percent of Japanese graduate? So we, we said 56.2% of Americans graduate college. Do you know what percent of Japanese graduate college? It's 85%. 85% of Japanese college students graduate college. Write that down in your notes. 85% graduate. 15% do not graduate Japanese college because of money problems or because they didn't study or some reason. Okay. Uh, so we can see the outline of American colleges here, uh, American schools. Now we're going to start talking about um, elementary school uh, with American education here. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this came from our handout. I'm going to I'm going to flip through this. First year freshman, sophomore. Notice it's soft. More sophomore, junior, June year, senior, seen year. I want you to memorize these and how to say them. Okay, uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. All right. We said seventy-one percent of American children graduate from high school. Forty-nine percent will enter college. Actually, I wrote fifty. Fifty. Twenty-seven percent of American children will graduate college. Forty-five. Do not graduate college. All right. Um, we're going to go on. Uh, college entrance exams. Uh, to, excuse me. 25.8% of colleges in America require a test. Okay. Now, Japanese are like, what? All colleges require a test. Nope. Most colleges in America do not require a test. 25.8% do not. It's easy to get into an American college. You take an ACT or an SAT. That's like in Japan, the, um, what do you call it? The um, Senta Nyu, Nyushi, Senta Nyushi, Senta Nyu Gakushiken. It's, uh, that's what the ACT and the SAT are. Now, 30% require proof of success. That is, if you graduated high school and you got really good grades, you can go into our college, okay? So 25%, 0.8% require a test. 30% just if you did well in high school, that's good enough. And 44% only did you hire, graduate high school. Even if you had very, very bad grades, if you graduated high school, you can come into college, okay? Um, and you might think, oh, that means American colleges are easy. No, uh, many people go into the college and they fail. Okay, so a lot of people fail the colleges. But uh, Americans do not study for entrance exams. Uh, when I went into college, I didn't think about entrance exams. We don't study for entrance exams for junior high. We just go any junior high. High school, you go to any high school and there's no test. Uh, college, I did not study for entry entrance exam for college. I just went into college, uh, but I knew that if I didn't study seriously, I would fail the college. And so I had to study very hard. Okay, getting college and easy is easy. Getting out of college is difficult. All right. Now, elementary school. Elementary school is a time of dependence. Students are dependent on the teacher. Now, I think that's true in every culture. The little children are dependent. Students learn to speak out their opinions. And I'm going to teach you this IRE very soon. Not today, but next week or next week. Next, next week. Students are taught to use knowledge to actively solve problems. They don't just study problems in a book, but they're thought, think. What about, what if this happened? So we learn math and then we say, now, uh, John had uh, 59 uh, dogs and 43 of them got sick and 26 of them got well. How many uh, dogs are still sick? And then, but that's easy logic. We go deeper, deeper, deeper into logic. We teach children to solve problems. Here's some uh, pictures of an elementary school. You see that there's no uniforms and we have a lot of black, white, Hispanic, uh, many different races, um, boys and girls studying together. Uh, look at the pictures here, very colorful, colorful. 
color is considered important for American schools. Here we have, uh, this is an Asian boy. Uh, he looks maybe from India. He's Asian, she's Asian. He's got red hair, so he's a white boy. A uh, white boy maybe, all right? A mix, very many mixed races. Again, you have the colorful room, okay? Uh, here's a very colorful room. Little children, let's count these children. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, 16 is about average for a number of children in the school. A very colorful room, lots of activities. Okay, uh, now next we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna compare two elementary schools. We're gonna uh, study, uh, look, just look at some differences between a Japanese and an American elementary school. Okay, I'm gonna finish this um, lecture on education, on elementary education. It's gotten to be dark in my room. It's a little at nighttime now, and so the lighting's changed, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're going to compare two schools. I'm going to compare a Japanese school in Kofu, Japan, with an American school in Austin, Texas. The school in Kofu, Japan was a school uh, where actually my boys went to school here in Japan. And then the one in, in Austin, Texas is a school where my wife taught in Texas. Now, every school in America is a little different. Every school in Japan is a little different. But by comparing these two schools, we can get some idea of what some of the differences are between Japanese and American schools. Okay, so I'm sharing this <clears throat> handout now. This handout is called Some Differences Between U.S. and Japanese Elementary Schools. Okay, here, uh, the handout is called Comparing Elementary Schools in Japan and U.S. right here. Okay, uh, so in this school in Japan, when my boys went to school, and many schools in Japan, students walk to school, it's, this is transportation, students walk to school in a group. Now many Japanese say, well of course they walk to school in a group, but that's not the way children go to school in America. In America, in Austin, Texas, and in most schools in America, students walk to school alone. They do not walk in groups. Sometimes they might get in a group, but usually no. Uh, if they want their friend to walk with them, they can, but they just walk alone. Or they ride their bicycle to school, or parents take the students to school in the car. Now, this is usual for parents. Uh, when I was first and second grade, when I was in first grade, my mother uh, took me to school by car. In second grade, I began to ride my bicycle to school. Um, I lived about three kilometers from school. So in first grade, my mother took me, and after that, I rode my bike. If it was raining, my mother would take me by, this, by the car. If it was not raining, I would ride my bicycle. If there was snow or very, very cold, my mother would take me by the car to the school. The schools in America have very big parking lots and so it's okay for many parents to bring their cars. And then uh, in, on the TV, they always have buses. Don't schools have buses? Yes, uh, many schools have buses. Uh, it depends on how far away the children live. America, there are many, many um, long, excuse me, there are long distances between houses and schools in America because America's a big land. And so sometimes, they need buses to take the children, but other places uh, inside the city, all the children live close, and so there's no buses. And so it really depends on how big the school is and how far away the children live. Now time, in this um, uh, elementary school I'm speaking of in Kofu, Japan, they started at 8.20 and they ended it at 3.30, but sometimes, often, the children would come home at 1.30. And my wife would be shocked. She would say, it's 1.30, why did you come home? And my boys in Kofu Elementary School would say, I don't know, the teacher just told us go. So we went home. And so the time would sometimes change 
different times that the class was over, usually 3.30, but sometimes it would be home earlier. In America, it's always begins at the same time, ends at the same time, always, always, always. And in Austin, Texas, school began at eight o'clock, ended at 3.05 every day. Now in Japan, the schools are from Monday to Friday and two Saturdays every month they meet. Uh, some schools meet for half day in Japan. And uh, in America, schools meet Monday to Friday only. And Friday is like a traditional day of celebration. We never ever have Saturday class. We never have clubs. There are no clubs on Saturdays. There are no clubs on Sundays. There are only classes and clubs on Monday through Friday. So Friday night, all the kids, all the teenagers feel, I'm free. School's over for, uh, for three days, you know, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. And so Friday's a big celebration day. And it's also uh, a busy time at the, at the malls, and it's date time. For, uh, for teenage boys and girls. They go on dates on Friday night. So Sunday, uh, in Japan, Saturday night is date night. But in America, Friday night is date night because it's our last day of school. Uniforms. Now, uh, in old Japan, they had uniforms. In new Japan now, there are no uniforms for elementary schools. For junior high and high school, there are uh, uniforms but not for elementary. And in, when my boys were attending elementary school in Japan, they wore uniforms. And in the cold, cold winter time, uh, elementary school boys had to wear short pants, very, very short, and their legs were freezing cold. And we always asked the parents, you have a cold winter coat on, very warm coat, but your child has this little uniform with short pants. And the parents would say, ha, 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 that's right. It makes the boys strong. And uh, so that was the uniform. But now there's no uniforms in Japan for elementary children. Americans never have uniforms, never. Actually, in private schools, uh, elementary, junior high, and high school, many times American private schools have uniforms. But in a public school, the parents would never allow it because Americans actually hate uniforms. And so the parents would fight the schools too much if they tried to make them wear uniforms. But the private schools can say, look, if you don't want to wear a uniform, don't go to our school. So the private schools have more power. Now for uniform, for shoes, Japan has outdoor shoes. They walk to school in their shoes. Then they stop at the door. They change shoes. They put on the wabaki. The wabaki are indoor shoes. And uh, Americans, American children have outdoor shoes only. They wear the outdoor shoes inside. Actually, we don't call them outdoor shoes. We just call them shoes. And we are very strong to clean our floors. And the children don't clean the floors. We have professional people to clean the floors every day. Um, lunch serving clothes in, in Jap Japanese schools, uh, excuse me, in Japanese schools, often uh, children will help to serve the food to the other children. They bring the food on trays, they bring bowls. And so they put these special clothes on to serve the clothes, the food. Uh, American children never serve food. They just uh, walk in, the food's finished for them, they eat it and they walk out. Um, PE clothes. Uh, Japanese children wear PE clothes and uh, it's a little embarrassing uh, for American children. My child went to a Japanese school and they said, okay, it's time, we're gonna change clothes. We're gonna have swimming and everybody change your swimming clothes. And they did not divide the boys and the girls. They left them in one room. And they said, put a towel around you. And now change clothes under your towel. And so my son said, I refuse. I'm American. I will not do this. He was so angry that they would try to make him dress into his PE clothes in front of girls, even though he had a towel around him. That's just culture. 
it's hard for us to change our culture. Americans never change clothes during PE class. We just keep the same clothes on. Sorry, it it's kind of makes you stinky and hot. Uh, clean, cleaning clothes. Japanese kids clean the schools. They clean the bathrooms. They clean the halls. They clean the uh, stairs. And they wear, uh, they put on a little bit of costume and a hat and gloves and they cleaned. Uh, American kids never clean schools. We hire professional men to clean our schools. The children work 180 days and they work the whole time studying only. And then when they finish, they go home. And so there's no special clothes for cleaning. So we can see that in Japanese society, having the right clothes is important. This continues in Japanese companies where people often wear special clothes. Americans love freedom. There you go. Americans love freedom and Americans hate special clothes. And most companies do not have uniforms. Uh, the banks do not have uniforms. Everybody wears different clothes. The companies do not have uniforms. Office workers, Oeru, the office ladies, they do not wear uniforms. They all wear their own different clothes. It's just our culture. And so in, in uh, school, the schools are training the Japanese children to wear uniforms, training the American children not to wear uniforms. Number of school days. Japan has 240 days, usually, of class. And that's, uh, the law of Japan says you must have 210 days of class. And most schools have 30 days extra. So what they do is, the 210 days they must teach regular classes. The 30 days they're kind of relaxed. And so, uh, like the undokai, the exercise day, sports day, they will spend two weeks uh, practicing for that. And they'll spend many hours practicing um, during school for the sports day. And uh, that's because they have 30 extra days that they can just use for anything. They don't have to use them for classes. And so the total is 240 days for Japanese classes. Uh, American elementary schools have only 180 days. Uh, there are 50 states and every state's different, but the average is 180. And um, we that's 60 days less than Japanese schools every year. And you might think, well, Japanese, don't they learn more? Maybe, but the Americans use their time very carefully. Children do not clean classes, uh, do not clean the building during school. Uh, we do not have a sports day during school. We do not have festivals during school. If we do clubs or anything, it's always after school. So it's 180 days of careful study. Now, for in Japanese culture, spending a lot of time at work is important. And so the children are trained in school, spend a lot of time in school. And even after school, spend a lot of time in clubs. And so the children are spend a lot of time at school and in clubs at school. And many children come home late every day and they go to school five or six days a week. The American culture requires us to be efficient and work every uh, minute. If we're not going to be working, we should go home, okay? When we're finished, we should go home. So we don't want to be at work or at school a long, long time. Uh, we want to go home when we're finished working. It's just our culture. Parents in Japan want their children to be with friends. Parents will often say to me, oh, social things are important. I want my children to have friends, be with their friends. And traditional uh, families in America, they want children to be at home. The parents don't say, I want my children to be with their friends. The parents say, I want the children to be with me. Family time is important. But this is changing in America. Uh, many families in America are now not spending time together. But that traditionally they do. Cost. Uh, both Japan, America and Japan have taxes and their schools are paid by taxes. Uh, and many Japanese will say, no, school's free. 
But uh, when my boys went to Japanese school, uh, every month the school would send a note and say, well, we want you to send us 10,000 yen because we're buying new science equipment for your children. We want you to send uh, 5,000 yen because we want new paint brushes for art. And, and it, they constantly asked us for money. And it cost between eight to 10,000 yen per month just sending money to the school so they could buy more and more supplies for our children. American schools are paid by taxes. and We never send money to school for books or supplies. The school has to pay for everything. Uh, lunch is free in Japan. Lunch is not free in America. School lunch is $1.50 a day, which is about 150, 160 yen for a day for lunch. Uh, in America, since the school lunches are not free, if a child's family is poor, the government will give them free lunch so they can help the poor people. Class break. Now, this is an interesting idea because actually there, there is no class break in America. There's a class break in Japan. What I mean is, for example, from 9 o'clock until um, 9.50, the teacher will, okay, let's say from 9 to 9.10, the homeroom teacher will check the role and call the names and take care of business. Then from 9.10, to 10 o'clock, that's 50 minutes, the teacher might teach mathematics, okay? And so um, after mathematics, from 10 until 10.05 or 10 until 10.10, there's a class break in the Japanese uh, schools, at least there was in the Kofu school that I'm talking about. Five to 10 minutes break. And the teacher leaves the class and goes and goes to the bathroom or goes to the teacher's room or makes copies. And uh, at this time, the children in Japanese schools, they run around, uh, they talk to each other, they play, they throw things, they open the window and look outside. And this is a class break. In American schools, there are no class breaks. When the teacher finishes a mathematics class, the teacher says, okay, students, we're finished with math class. Uh, put your books away, and now let's get our science books out or, or English books out. And then they just keep studying, and they don't have a five or ten minute break between each class. Now, if you have a five to ten minute break for math, English, uh, PE, um, library class, music, you know, all day long, that's like five breaks a day. That's uh, anywhere between 25 to 50 minutes of your day just in breaks. But Americans don't have breaks. So um, we use our time a little bit more carefully. Uh, and so we, we only have 180 days in school. Okay, now uh, the teacher never leaves the room. Kids must always be watched because if there's an accident, the school, school can be sued for money. Sue means that the parents go to the police and say, we think that this school should pay us money because our child was hurt in an accident. And then the school has to pay a lot of money. And so uh, if the teacher ever leaves the room, then that can happen. And so we don't leave the room. And uh, so there's no class break for uh, American classes. Now you might think, well, what does the teacher do uh, in the American schools? How can the teacher go to the bathroom? How can the teacher make copies? Well, you're gonna see later that in music and in PE and library, we have professional music teacher, professional PE teacher, professional library teacher, and the students go to these classes and the teacher gets a break then, but the students don't get a break. They just go straight to the other class and keep studying. And the teacher's like, oh, I've got 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes to work or to relax. So the teacher gets a little break. Now lunch uh, in Japanese schools, often the students eat in the room with the teacher. 
and there's no choice of food. They, they just uh, bring the food in and the children all eat it. In America, they always eat in a cafeteria. Teacher says, children, line up. Now walk to the cafeteria, please. And the teacher walks with them. And then the students sit at the students' tables and the teachers sit at the teachers' tables and all the teachers talk and all the students talk, but they're separate. They're in the same room, but they're separate. Now, uh, Japanese, the uh, many Japanese schools, there's no choice of food. You just one food and everybody gets the same. But America is famous for being free and having choices. And so in my wife's school where she taught, there were four choices. One is the lunch set. This is the usual one. Today's special set. It might be anything. Fried fish. It might be um, a steak. It might be um, macaroni noodles with cheese or spaghetti. Uh, and then there's always a, um, some kind of vegetable and milk to drink and sometimes a salad. Or if the children don't like that, the children can get a small pizza. If the children don't want to eat just a pizza, they can get a hamburger and french fries. If the children don't like the lunch set or pizza or hamburger, the children can bring their own lunch from home. This is like an obento, but we put it in a bag and we call it a sack lunch, okay? So you have four choices whenever you want to eat, but everyone always has to eat at the cafeteria. Recess. Recess means playtime. Uh, some schools have no recess in Japan. Some schools in Japan have a 20 minute recess, okay, where they let the children play. In America, for elementary, they usually have a 20 or 30 minute playtime, recess time. They go outside and they just play. And the teacher has to watch them play. Music. In Japan, the regular teacher teaches music. Um, in America, there's a special music teacher, a professional music teacher. That's her job. In Japan, all students learn to read music notes. So the students can read them, look at the music, scale, ah, 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 whoops, ah, 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 and they can read it and they know music. American children don't learn to read music. I don't know why. But I didn't learn it. I learned it to read music when I learned piano. My piano teacher taught me. And I don't know very much about reading music. In Japan, everyone learns to play a recorder. But in American elementary schools, they only sing. They do not learn a musical instrument. In junior high and high school, they have band. And they can learn an instrument then. In Japan, in PE, physical education, the regular teacher teaches PE. In America, a special, a professional PE teacher teaches PE. That teacher's job all day is just teach PE to children. In library, the regular teacher helps students to choose a book. They go to the library, they choose a book, they come back. In America, uh, sometimes they do that, but many times there's a special library teacher it's a professional library teacher. She reads a story to the students and helps the students to choose a book. And I, I loved library. We would go once every week and the teacher would, uh, we'd walk to the library um, and go inside and sit down and the teacher would say, now children, I'll read you a story. And she would open a book and she would read a wonderful story to us. And we're just like, ah, oh, we loved listening to the stories. And then the teacher would say, now you have 10 minutes uh, to pick out a book. So everybody find any book in the library. And we would get a book and we would check out the book. And my library teacher, I don't know why, but she had a specialty. She liked to pull children's teeth. That's true. If a child's tooth was loose, like, oh, my tooth, my tooth is going to come out. Um, the librarian at my school, she would always say, ha ha, I'll pull your tooth out. Come to the teacher. Uh, Mrs. Burke was her name. Mrs. Burke would say, come to me and I'll pull your tooth. And, and so children would come, Mrs. Burke, please pull my tooth. And she would oh, pull their tooth out. Uh, now in today's American society, people sue teachers so much that they can't do that anymore. 
but that's my memory of my librarian. She was a good story reader and she pulled children's teeth. Now computers, uh, in Japan, when my boys were in school, there were no computers in the elementary school. Now there may be some elementary schools with computers, but not very many. Uh, when my wife was teaching in Texas, there are three or more computers in every class. And some classes have one computer for every student. And so there's a lot of computers in America in the classes. Air conditioners and heaters. Now this is a key point. Uh, in Japan, there are no air conditioners in school. Americans are crazy about air conditioners and we use them everywhere. And so there are always air conditioners in, in elementary, in the junior high, in the high school, air conditioners everywhere. Japan, some schools have them, some schools don't. But actually, many of the schools that have air conditioners, they don't use them. They say, we'll turn them on when it gets really hot. And they don't turn them on very much. But in America, their air conditioners are on all the time. Uh, heaters, I think Japan and America both have heaters, okay? Uh, okay, so those are some examples of differences between the schools. You can see how that the uh, uniforms show the differences between group and individual dressing between American and Japanese culture. You can see um, how that among the teachers, the Japanese teachers tend to do everything. The Americans hire professionals to do many things like music, PE, library, even computers. And so these are cultural differences. The air conditioners, the Americans really love air conditioners. We spend a lot of money for air conditioners. And Japanese say, oh, you can, you can just be hot and you're learning to be tough, learning to be strong. And that's a cultural difference. Okay, we're gonna stop for today. I'm finished teaching today. Uh, there's really not any uh, homework today. I hope that you took good notes, that you wrote down some important things, and you're gonna be able to take the test in the future when we take our midterm exam. That's coming up in a few weeks, the midterm exam, so get ready. All right, thank you everyone, and have a good week.